You may be seated. Welcome to just another Sunday at Johns Creek United Methodist Church. <laughs> that hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, was written by a one-time Methodist pastor. He wrote it on the anniversary of his conversion, and it was sung first on a Pentecost Sunday. Unfortunately, he was prone to wonder, and he became a Baptist pastor for a while, and then a Unitarian, uh, and then I think he kind of left the faith altogether for a little bit. But from that day to this, I don't know if it's ever been performed as well as we just experienced. It's one of the best loved hymns of the church, and probably one of the most questioned hymns of the church. Probably one of the number one questions I get is, what am I raising when I raise my Ebenezer? <laughs> it comes from the book of Samuel, and after uh, the Israelites defeat the Philistines in a battle, Samuel says to raise a stone of remembrance to, bring, to remind the people of how God brought them to this point of victory, and it's called an Ebenezer. Our estimate of giving is kind of like raising an Ebenezer. It's like remembering how far God has brought us and trusting God's faithfulness in the days ahead. It's just a small poem that a pastor wrote to remember his conversion and offered to his congregation, but it became a great gift to the church. We're celebrating gifts that sometimes appear small, but wind up being great gifts in the church today. Part of that celebration for me is our family has a longtime friend who's worshiping together with us today, Dr. George Freeman. George and I met when I was just a couple years out of seminary and he welcomed me to a weekly breakfast as an equal colleague. George started Simpsonwood United Methodist Church down in Peachtree Corners years ago. And when I was sent to uh, start a new congregation, George was one of the first people I called and he said, don't do it. <laughs> and George has offered me several other good pieces of advice over the years. He was supportive of Kristen as she started into her own ministry. When my father died, George preached his funeral, and I still remember lines from that homily. I want to warn you that there won't be much funny in my sermon today because all my best lines I stole from George years ago. <laughs> my favorite Georgeism is in my humble and correct opinion, and nobody can deliver that line quite like George as often as I've tried. But the reason I'm most excited that George is worshiping with us today is George is a lifelong tither and he came on Commitment Sunday to Johns Creek United Methodist Church. Unfortunately, Peggy, who controls the checkbook in the household, is not with him today, however. Our closing hymn is another gift from a lifelong Methodist. Blessed Assurance was written by Fanny Crosby. She was born in 1820, and by the age of six weeks, she lost her eyesight through a medical procedure that went bad. She was raised by her widowed mother and grandmother, and many thought in that time and in that place that Fanny was going to be reduced to a life of just trying to somehow work out a meager existence on the very edge of society. She would go to the New York Institute for the Blind, and after graduating from that school, she was hired to be a teacher there. She later met uh, another fellow student who joined the faculty, and they married. She spent a lot of her time advocating and working for immigrants in New York City who were living in some of the worst slums. She devoted her energy to trying to improve their living conditions and help them uh, acclimate to their new country. 
She started writing poetry when she was six years old. It was kind of an amazing feat. She never was able to write herself. So she would work out her poems in her mind, and when she had them all worked out, dictate them to a friend who would write them out for her. By the time she went to the New York Institute for the Blind, her poetry was starting to become well-known among her peers. When the famed poet William Cullen Bryant attended the school or visited the school one day, someone shared some of her poems with him and he asked to speak to young Crosby. When he met her, he encouraged her to continue her writing and said, I think one day many will be touched by this work. She would go on to write over 8,000 gospel songs and hymns. It's hard to really know exactly how many she wrote. In those days, hymn editors liked to produce hymns that had multiple authors in them. So Fanny started uh, writing with pen names, and she used over 200 pseudonyms with her work. So it's hard to trace exactly how many she really produced. At one point, she set a goal of writing six hymns a day. When she first started publishing her hymns, she committed her commission to go to support the missions that she devoted herself to in New York City. She didn't think it would ever amount to much, but it was probably way more than what she ever earned as a teacher. The story of writing Blessed Assurance is almost as remarkable as her life itself. She was visiting a friend in New York City one afternoon and the family was having what was thought to be the largest pipe organ installed in a private residence at that time put in their home. Her friend wanted to play a tune that she had recently written for Fanny, but since the organ wasn't complete yet, she had to call her over to the piano, and she played the tune and then looked at Fanny and said, what do you think of that? And Fanny Crosby said, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. She finished the hymn before she left the room that day. And it too has become a favorite hymn of the church. Just a small gift that has made a huge difference. I thought of that because our scripture story this morning from the Gospel of John is a story about how a small gift from a surprising source made a huge difference. Can you imagine if young Fanny Crosby at six years old has been told, you can't possibly write poetry, you can't even write? What kind of difference did it make in her life that those few kind words from the famed poet encouraged her to continue her poetic gifts? This story is perhaps the best known miracle of Jesus. When John tells it, he tells us some details that we don't pick up in the other Gospels. And part of those details are about where this surprising gift that allows this miracle to happen come from. I'm going to read from John chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, 
Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we pray that you quieten our hearts and minds so that through these words of scripture that have been read, we might hear your voice speaking good news to our hearts and our lives this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All four Gospels tell about this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. John is the only one who tells us about the little boy producing the five loaves and two fish. Have you ever wondered what was going through that kid's mind that day? We, we don't know how he got there in the crowd. We don't know if he was there with his family. He might be related to Andrew. Maybe that's how Andrew knew he had the loaves and fish. It's kind of funny to think about a disciple going around snooping through people's lunch bags, but I mean, there it is. Maybe he had been sent to the market to buy some food for his family and was on his way home. Can you imagine showing up at the house and saying, well, I bought the loaves and the fish, but this uh, prophet guy decided he wanted to try and distribute it to 5,000 people. We don't know. And the disciples, when Jesus raises the question of how are we going to feed these people, are kind of just in awe of the need. Philip says, Lord, it would take more than half a year's salary to buy enough food to give each of them just a little morsel. Even when Andrew brings the boy to Jesus, it's hard to know exactly what Andrew was expecting. Was Andrew saying, look, this is all we have? Let's give up this endeavor and just send the people away? Was he expecting Jesus to do something miraculous? What we know is any gift offered in the presence of Jesus, Jesus can take, bless, and multiply it far beyond what we think or imagine. Five loaves and two fish. Doesn't seem like much in the face of such need. Bishop Kenneth Carter tells a story of worshiping with a downtown church for a midweek service. It was on a winter night and as they were gathered in the chapel of the church, the congregation that was gathered there noticed someone walk in that wasn't a part of their fellowship. From the way the man was dressed, they quickly assumed he was one of the people living on the streets in the downtown community. One of them noticed that the man had no shoes on and went over and asked if if he needed a pair of shoes and the man said, yes, I don't have any shoes at all. 
person quickly ran to the clothes closet that the church ran and looked, and sure enough, there were no shoes to be found for men and all that they had gathered there. Came back, and others started to call some of the downtown stores, only to discover that they were already closed for the evening. One man offered to drive across town to the shopping center and purchase a pair of shoes there and bring them back for the man. They started to try and figure out his shoe size and make plans. And as they were doing that, another gentleman walked over and handed the man a pair of shoes. The man who had wandered in thanked him, put the shoes on, and walked out. Bishop Carter looked at the man who had brought the gift of the shoes and noticed that he now was barefoot. And he said, what made you think to give your own shoes to that man? And the gentleman responded, it seemed like such a small gift. I have other pairs of shoes at home in my closet and I can easily replace those shoes. It just seemed like a small thing. Bishop Carter says as he reflected on that and what a gift that, that, what a difference that small gift made in the life of one individual, he remembered this story of this young boy offering his five loaves and two fish to Jesus that day. It just doesn't seem like much. As I've been reflecting on this story this week, I've I've really been struck by something that happens towards the end of the story. When Jesus tells the disciples to gather up the leftovers, it's there in all the gospel accounts of this story, but for some reason it just really started to uh, speak to me this week because my mind does strange things and I started to wonder what did they do with those leftovers? Like, did they give them to the little boy and say, okay, take this home? Did they use them to go out and bless other people? Could you imagine taking one of those baskets of leftovers and gathering a group of friends and sharing with them the story of Jesus feeding thousands of people from just a small gift? Gifts offered in the presence of Jesus will be used to bless and to bless and to bless far beyond we sometimes realize or think or imagine. Throughout this month, as we've talked about your generosity, we have tried to highlight some of the ways your giving blesses others and ministries that you don't often get to see or participate in. A few weeks ago, we were hosting a middle school concert here in the sanctuary. The school had rented it out for a choral concert, I think it was, Meg. Meg was here and some others to welcome them, and they were very thankful and appreciative of this space and of being able to perform their concert here. This past week, we got a large envelope stuffed with thank you notes from the kids. And they're all handwritten, and they're just some amazing gifts that they offer to us. Thanks, Johns Creek United Methodist Church. Thanks for letting our group perform in your church. Thanks a lot. I think there was a certain number of words the kids had to use. (laughs) You'll notice that in this next note. Thank you, Johns Creek United Methodist Church, for hosting our concert. It was really, 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 really fun. I hope we have another concert there. But the one that is by far the favorite of our staff, thank you for hosting our concert. Thank you. You are so slay. (laughs) Times 10,000. Now, I don't speak contemporary tween, (laughs) but our very young staff have informed me that that's good. (laughs) Is that right? That's a good thing? 
Slay times 10,000? That seems like, I mean, we're really rocking it here at Johns Creek United Methodist Church. At that same concert, there was a mother who was sitting in the sanctuary. And while she was sitting here, she remembered a tragedy that struck their family almost a year before. She was so overwhelmed that she left. And in all that was going on, she left her purse in one of the pews. After a couple of days, she realized what had happened or what she thought had happened and called the church to see if her purse was still here and it had been found. She and her husband came to pick up the purse and when they came to pick it up, they asked if they could come spend some time in the sanctuary. They connected with Pastor Pam and they shared what that tragedy was that had so overwhelmed the mother that evening. Pastor Pam spent some time with them and prayed with them and as they were leaving the building they couldn't say enough how thankful they were just to spend some time in this place. And they insisted on leaving a donation to the church. It just almost seems like leftovers. We were hosting a concert that in part was paid for by the school. We were trying to be hospitable. We were hoping maybe some people were moved to come and join our fellowship. And we couldn't even imagine the ministry that Jesus was doing right in our midst. We are in the midst of trying to put together a multi-million dollar budget for the coming year. Part of that funding is about $2.2 million from pledged giving. That may seem like a lot for some of us. It works out to an average gift of around $7,500 for 300 giving units. Some of us can give more than that. Some of us can't give that much. But know that each and every gift offered in the presence of Jesus will be blessed and used to touch lives that can't even be counted. What a great thing to be a part of. Thanks be to God.